In this next series of tutorials, we're going to be looking at different ways that mathematicians and philosophers have interpreted the concept of probability. What it means to say that the probability of rolling a 6 is 1 in 6, or there's a 60% chance of rain today. We'll see that there are several different ways of interpreting this language, and for this reason these are sometimes called different interpretations or different theories of probability. The first interpretation we're going to look at is also one of the earliest and most important and it's come to be called the classical interpretation of probability. The classical interpretation comes from the work of mathematicians in the 17th and 18th century. People like Laplace, Pascal, Fermat, Huygens, and Leibniz. These guys were trying to work out the principles that govern games of chance and gambling games like dice and cards and roulette. And in particular they were interested in working out the best betting strategies for different games. This was where the modern mathematical theory of probability was born. The main idea behind the classical interpretation is very straightforward. Given some random trial with a set of possible outcomes, like tossing a coin or rolling a dice, we say that the probability of any particular outcome is just the ratio of the favorable cases to the total number of equally possible cases. Now here, a favorable case is just a case where the outcome in question occurs. So if we're talking about a coin toss, the probability of it landing heads is obviously one half on this interpretation. There's only two possible outcomes, heads or tails, so the denominator is two. And of those two, there's only one case where it lands heads, so the numerator is one. Let's look at a dice example. What's the probability of rolling a two on a six-sided die? Well, there are six equally possible outcomes, and only one outcome where it lands two, so the numerator is one and the denominator is 6. So the answer is 1 in 6, or 0.17, or about 17%. If we want to know the probability of rolling an even number, then our situation is a bit different. Now our favorable cases include three of the six possible outcomes, 2, 4, and 6, which are the even numbers. So the probability is just 3 out of 6, or 1 half. These results are all correct, and the reasoning seems intuitively right. But it's clear that this only works if each of the elementary outcomes is equally possible. The classical interpretation is especially well suited to games of chance that are designed precisely to satisfy this condition. This is an interpretation of probability that was born in casinos, in gambling halls, and card tournaments. However, it's not at all clear that this interpretation of probability is adequate as a general interpretation of the probability concept. In particular, this condition that all the outcomes be equally possible has been a cause for concern. What exactly does equally possible mean in general? If we just mean equally probable, then there's a risk of circularity, since our definition of probability is now invoking the concept of probability in the definition. The French mathematician Pierre Simon Laplace famously tried to clarify this idea. He says that we should treat a set of outcomes as equally possible if we have no reason to consider one more probable than the other. This is known as Laplace's principle of indifference, though it was John Maynard Keynes who actually coined this expression in the 1920s. The idea is that if we have no reason to consider one outcome more probable than another, then we shouldn't arbitrarily choose to favor one outcome over another. Doing that would be irrational. We are intended to use this principle of indifference in cases where we have no evidence at all for what the elementary probabilities might be, and in cases where we have symmetrically balanced evidence like in the case of coin tosses and dice rolls, where you know, given the geometry and symmetry of a cubical dice, that each side is equally likely to land as any other. So, one strength of the classical interpretation is that it gives intuitively satisfying answers to a wide variety of cases where these conditions apply, like games of chance. But, it has a lot of weaknesses as a general theory of probability. Let me just lay out a couple of objections to the theory. Consider, for example, how we might use this interpretation to assign a probability value to the question, what are the odds that it's going to rain today? Okay, what's the favorable outcome? It rains. What's the set of possible alternative outcomes? It rains or it doesn't. But if we're forced to assign equal probabilities to each outcome in order to use the classical definition, as the principle of indifference suggests, and these are the two elementary outcomes, then the probability of it raining is always going to be one half according to this definition. That makes no sense. Something's clearly not right. This is an example of a situation where it's very hard to see how the necessary conditions for the use of the classical definition could apply and make intuitive sense of the question.
In this case, it's not obvious how to define the set of alternative outcomes that are supposed to be equally possible. However, the most serious objections to the classical interpretation of probability are consistency objections. It seems that under this interpretation, it's possible to come up with contradictory probability assignments depending on how you describe the favorable outcomes relative to the space of possible outcomes. And the interpretation doesn't have the resources to resolve these contradictions without smuggling in other concepts of probability. Here's a well-known example from the literature that illustrates the problem. Suppose a factory produces cubes with a side length between 0 and 1 meter. We don't know anything about the production process. Question. What is the probability that a randomly chosen cube has a side length between 0 and half a meter? In other words, what is the probability that a randomly chosen cube is smaller than that box X right there? Well, given this phrasing of the question, it's natural to spread the probability evenly over these two event types, picking a cube that has a side length between 0 and half a meter, and picking a cube that has a side length between half a meter and a meter. Why? because we don't have any reason to think that one outcome is more probable than the other. So the classical interpretation would give us an answer of one half to this question, and we can see why. Since we've got two equally possible outcomes, the box length is either between 0 and 0.5 or between 0.5 and 1, and that number goes in the denominator, and only one favorite outcome, the box length is between 0 and 0.5, and that number goes in the numerator, this gives us 1 over 2 or 1 half. Now, to see how the consistency problem arises, let's take the exact same setup, but let's phrase the question slightly differently. Suppose our factory produces cubes with face area, not side length, but the area of the face of a cube, between 0 and 1 square meter. So the area of the face of every cube is between 0 and 1 square meter. Question: What is the probability that a randomly chosen cube has a face area between 0 and 1 quarter square meters? Now, phrased this way, the natural answer, using the classical interpretation, is going to end up being 1 over 4 instead of 1 half. Why? Because it's natural to now consider four equally possible event types. Picking a cube with an area between 0 and a quarter square meters, picking a cube between a quarter and a half square meters, picking a cube between a half and three quarter square meters, and picking a cube between three quarter and one square meter. We don't have any reason to think that one of these outcomes is more likely than any other. So the principle of indifference will tell us to assign equal probabilities to each. Our favorable outcome is just one out of these four equally possible outcomes. So the numerator is 1, and the denominator is 4, giving 1 over 4. So I hope that's clear enough. In the diagram, I've just labeled the outcomes A, B, C, and D to help make the point, since all we're doing is calculating the ratio of the number of favorable outcomes to the total number of possible outcomes. Now here's the point. I want you to see that these two questions, one, what is the probability of randomly choosing a cube with side length between zero and half a meter, and two, what is the probability of randomly choosing a cube with face area between zero and one quarter square meters, these two questions are asking for the probability of the same event. Why? Because the cubes with a side length of one half are also the cubes with a face area of one quarter, since the area of the face is just one half times one half, which is a quarter or 0.5 times 0.5, which is 0.25. So all the cubes that satisfy the first description also satisfy the second description. The events are just described differently. In other words, that box X is the same box in both cases. And here's the problem. The classical interpretation of probability lets you assign different probabilities to the same event depending on how you formulate the question. It turns out there's literally an infinite number of different ways of reformulating this particular question and the classical interpretation gives different answers for every formulation. Now, this might not seem like a big deal to you, but this is regarded by mathematicians and philosophers as a fatal flaw in the theory. And it's one of the reasons why you won't find any experts today who defend the classical interpretation of probability as a general theory of probability. It gives the right answers in a bunch of special cases, and there's something about the reasoning in those cases that is intuitively compelling. But that's about the most you can say for the classical interpretation.